Richard Fagan. All right. Doing an interview. I appreciate you being a part of my documentary and everything. Happy to do so. Yes, sir. I see around your house you got plenty of hits. Colin Ray, Clay Walker, John Michael Montgomery. Numbers of big artists. Um, maybe, uh, maybe can you explain a little bit of your background, maybe, and how you got involved in songwriting, kind of what it takes for a person such as me or somebody who might want to be in this business to try to get a big platinum hit or anything like that, and also uh, how it feels to get all these records on your wall. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, I'm kind of a late bloomer. I mean, and been at it a long while, but I was maybe 30 before I really got into the business. I mean, music was my life. Uh, for some reason, when I was a kid, I always looked at the little names in parentheses on 45s. Yeah. And, you know, they're the writers. Yeah. And uh, I don't come from a musical family, but but I remember songs from when I was in the cradle. I remember songs my mom, you know, sang Put Me to Sleep. Yeah. And, but, you know, I took up guitar when I was a teenager. I used to sing doo-wop in groups. But I never really applied it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Back when the Beatles were happening, somebody came along and wanted to make me a star. And he said, do this song. I'm like, that song sucks. So <laughs> I started writing, but uh, my songs suck too. Yeah. So I don't even count them. But, you know, what it was was that uh, they were predictable. If I told you one line, you could tell me what the next line is. Uh, yeah. But in time, by the time I got out of the service, I started writing. I was writing better and uh, mostly was a stylist. And uh, somebody was looking for a singer, and uh, they picked me up, and, and we started talking. This guy encouraged me to write. So we demoed five songs, and a few years went by, but that first demo tape got to Bob Gaudio's teenage daughter, and got to this producer, Bob Gaudio, and he wanted one of my songs for Neil Diamond. So that's pretty much how haphazardly it Neil started. Neil Diamond's a huge name, especially back in the day. Oh, know. yeah, he, he was... Big. And, oh, yeah. and so it, it was, I had originally heard they wanted it for a film, uh, which would have been the jazz singer. Mm -hmm. And we went out to LA and we're at Bob Gaudio's house. Bob Gaudio, by the way, is the co-founder of the Four Seasons group, and he, he wrote most of their hits and produced them. But we were at his house and he got a call, he goes, oh, it's Neil Diamond, he wants to come over. So so we went in this little library pool room, and but well, mm -hmm. we could hear the music playing, and what happened was Neil cut an album of entire cover songs. There wasn't one original on the album. So uh, that's how my my song, The Good Lord Loves You, ended up on uh, the uh, September Morn album. So then Bob also got me a pop deal, so I did get some cuts of myself on Mercury Records. Uh, eventually things didn't pan out, and uh, in 84, you know, because we moved back out to L.A. and you know, we moved to, to Philly. And I was just kind of down on what to do next. And this fellow I met out at the L.A. Songwriter Showcase said, Hey, just moved to Nashville. Got a Mickey Billy cut. Come on, come on. Get down, to Nashville. Down. It was happening. So I came down. It was like I saw a vision. I went, this is where I'm supposed to be. First off, for, for my generation, and I'm 65, is uh, around that time, you know, pop music was... You know, just very linear, right. early rap, uh, punk, and new wave, and it wasn't my thing. Mm -hmm. So when I came to Nashville, the first thing I noticed is that contemporary country, and it's true today, contemporary country is always based on pop, uh, rock, and R&B. I mean, it's very 80s rock right now. I mean, a lot of people are trying to say that country's kind of going a little more pop, but then you got the Jason Aldean. It, it is more nowadays, start. and I can tell you why but I'll just stick with this. So okay. basically I got here and started writing. Uh, somebody had had a song that uh, they signed to Al Gallico, who he's a New Yorker, but had a company here. So I go to figure, well, I'll sign mine if I can get a reversion on it, get it back. And, and uh, Shelby Kennedy was working at his office and we just hit it off. So this, by the way, is how you do it in a business. It's, it's one thing leads to another. Just network, get to know people. I, I mean, I didn't do enough of it, but when I ran into Shelby, the first thing he said is that uh, I'll introduce you to my brothers and my, and my dad. Well, his brothers are both, both very talented, and his father, Jerry Kennedy, was at the time still working for Capitol Records. He had produced the Statler Brothers, Roger Miller, 
as a as a session player, he played on everybody's session. Roy Orbison, Elvis. Mm -hmm. He great. played Dobro on Harper Valley PTA. So that opened a lot of doors. In fact, I got my first two cuts and more cuts from through Jerry Kennedy. Just networking. Yeah, following and, the contacts. And, and Nashville was a smaller town than it is nowadays, but it's still the same way. You meet people. You go to the Bluebird Cafe, and us new writers that got to town, we'd always go to the Sunday Writers Nights and hopefully get a chance to play, and we'd always stay for the featured writer. And uh, we just got to know each other, so you tend to write with the group mm -hmm. that's at your level. And uh, she's Kathy Matea and her husband John Besner just moved to town around that time. It's a progressive thing. So that's how I got into it. And once I got here and got a few cuts, I was hooked. I said, right. I'm a songwriter and that's how I made my living. Explain how hard it is uh, to make a living off songwriting and, and, and your royalties and, and uh, you know. Well, the there's not as much money as people think. Right. And plus, things change. I mean, if you go back to when they invented the player piano, that hurt a few people because <laughs> they didn't need a piano player. Uh, I mean, but when the digital age came along, I mean, record sales went down because there's all these free downloads. So yeah. that changed the business. But back when I had the hits, your mechanicals would match your airplay. If you had a hit single and you made 65000 that quarter on that song, your your record sales would probably make about the same amount of money. That, that isn't happening now. Uh, another funny thing after the boom is uh, before the boom, uh, country, a big hit single was only making one fifth of the money. Now, the logic to that is, is there were five adult contemporary stations for every single country station. When Garth and the big boom hit, oh, yeah. Now there's five to one country. Now, you have to ask yourself, who are these people? Do they really know country music? So with everything like that, country music changes and, and it became more contemporary. Right now, it's very contemporary. There's not much traditional. and There's still room for it. Uh, bottom line is, if you take the long run, it's a very tough way to make a living. I had a good run in the 90s. Now I'm you know, struggling, but I, I still love what I do, right. and you know when I sort of ask God what I'm supposed to be doing, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. But if you're looking to get into it to strike it rich, uh, mm -hmm. it's it's a tough biz. But but if you do, make sure you you work hard when that happens. You pretty much have to be here. The odds. Uh, I mean, they seem stacked against you, but I mean, that's no attitude to have, is it? So, yeah, I mean, it's like if you want to be in the movies, you got to go to Hollywood. Yeah. And I think particularly songwriting, Nashville's a good ground for writing anything. I mean, through uh, musical history, Nashville's come up with a lot of hits, a lot of things that aren't country. I mean, you know, I was surprised when I moved here to know that uh, I'm, I'm from Philly, you know, mm -hmm. born and raised. And that song, Everlasting Love, da -da 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 -da, was written by two damn hillbillies. I didn't know <laughs> that. I mean, uh, uh, we're in this love together. Another Nashville song, Roger Murrah and, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? He'll get mad if I forget his name. Yeah. Uh, Keith Stegall. Keith Stegall. Mm -hmm. Uh, and just to show how songwriting goes, they wrote it for Johnny Mathis, and it got cut by Al Jarreau. And uh, so they wrote a song for Al Jarreau, and it ended up getting cut by Johnny Mathis. When I came down here, it was to visit my friend Mickey James, so I said that he just had a Mickey Gilly cut that he wrote with Casey Jones. Well, you know who they wrote it for? The Pointer Sisters. Ended up getting cut by Mickey Gilly, so you never know. I mean... Uh, just some funny stories. When Garth first came to town, first off, he opened for me at the Holiday Inn. I probably should have oh, said hi. Yeah. I mean, my intent was I'll talk to him after the show, and, and he was gone. There was only that moment in passing. Yeah. That ain't bad. I did get to meet him years later, and he's, he's a wonderful guy. And if, once he meets, he never forgets you, which is part it's of great. his success. It's great. Hey. But, but there was one guy Garth came up to at his gig and said, Man, I love that song. I'd really like to record it. He said, Oh, I'm saving this one for myself. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. 
Here's my theory on that, writers. Anybody that wants to cut your song, let them. I mean, that's just... You never made, know where it could lead. Yeah, I mean, it's sad when, when they don't sing it as good as your demo, yeah. but you never know. What's it hurt? I mean, if nothing happens to it, it's still a fresh tune. I mean, you don't hold on to something and make money. I mean, same way if, if you're an artist writer and people want to cut your songs, again, let them. You know, uh, what's his name? Jeffrey Steele. I mean, he came here to, to he, he was in, I think he was in Boy Howdy, but, but anyway, he had, had some experience, wanted to do a solo act, came here, and what what unfortunately happened was every time he tried to cut an album and put it out, people would end up cutting his songs. Well, <laughs> he made out all right. You oh, know, yeah. Maybe that's the way God wanted it. Yeah. You know? And same way for uh, Rivers Rutherford. Rivers, uh, Rivers was playing in Memphis. This is how it happened for Rivers. Uh, he was playing in Memphis and he decided to jump Chip Moman's fence and play him some songs. Dogs are barking. Chip comes out and like, ah, come on, man. And Chip smoked a cigarette, does a few songs. He takes his card and goes, okay, thanks a lot. Nothing happens. The next day, Chip calls up and he goes, hey, uh, I want you to come over and uh, play the song. Got some, got some fellas here. The Highwayman album. <laughs> So you never know. I mean, yeah. you you can't win if you don't play. And if you want to be a songwriter, Nashville is a creative vortex that, that draws us here. Watch out for some of the ways that you might be get that you could get burned. There's no need to sign your song to a publisher who just wants to sign your song. So it's now you're published, or I'll shop it. I mean, there really is no reason. Uh, what I used to do is you say, okay, I would like a, an advance and, and, a, and a six month reversion. Well, they might laugh in your face, but they might say, yeah, I think I can get that song cut in six months. And, and if they give you a reversion, sign. If they say two years, weigh it out. If they're credible and you say, okay, I'll sign it for two years. But I mean, what, what people can do is they can sign your song and then sit on it and five years later, when you're doing good, you get a cut. Guess what? They get 50% of your damn song. Yeah. So, I mean, be, the bottom line, be careful what you sign. And, uh, and especially, uh, never give anybody money to be your publisher because they're yeah. supposed to give you money. That's how right. it works. Uh, I've heard that many times before. If you can have your own publishing, that helps because, that, if nothing else, it's, it's something to negotiate. Like when we got here, we, we had a publishing company just because right with a friend, she put out a song, nobody's asked for your publishing, so okay, what's your publishing company? So you start one. So we got here and they said, we want your publishing. I said, I am a publisher. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, you know, so. Explain was, this right here. It, uh, when you write a song, it's 200%, correct? Well, when you write a song, you own the, the song mm -hmm. as a songwriter and as a publisher. Okay. However, it, it's an unpublished work. So if you start a company and say you're putting out an album, now it is a published work. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't put it out and you have it demoed, it's not a published work yet, but you are a publisher. So when you get it cut by, if you can get it to uh, George Strait or whatever and you get it cut, then you are the publisher. Or if, if his management wants a piece of the action, I mean, they do that. I mean, then at least you have something to negotiate with yeah. rather than just sign 50% of the song is publishing. So when you when you sign with a publisher, you're giving away 50% of your song to somebody or you're part of the song. Yeah, so I mean, be aware of that. The, the main thing is be careful what you sign. Same way of, of uh, I know you're doing the artist thing. If somebody just says, uh, if you give me so and so much money, I'll produce your record and I'll get your record deal. Be wary of that. See if they have a track record, if that's what they do. Because what other people do, is they'll cut your record and they'll get it to all the labels. They'll drop it off. They might even take a meeting. But they don't care if they get you a deal because they already got their money, right? So, you know, when you're working with people, if somebody will work with you on a contingency basis, that's the best thing. Mm -hmm. And just be careful what you sign because you can't unsign something. Right. You have to be catchy. Yeah. It has. It has, and it has to be fairly easy to sing. Yeah. Uh, that's why they called me in on Overnight Mail. Ron Harbin came up with the hook from uh, an advertising game that he 
got and saw this overnight mail and changed the spelling, called Kim. Kim was in the shower, and in the shower he got, because I'm a top flight, do you right, get you there by daylight, hold you tight, overnight mail. So he said, we got we got to bring Rich in because he's good with, with rock and with bad songs. Mm -hmm. So they called me up, and by the time they got there, I said, well, you got to flip-flop and do you right and hold you tight, because hold, hold you tight overnight, Swing. Yeah. Do you write overnights? And, and, and we just started writing. And, and I know I came up with the line, uh, uh, like the Pony Express in the Wild Wild West, I'll ride hard all night long. And Ron goes, <laughs> we, we, first we laughed. And then Ron goes, oh, that could cost us a cup. And, and Kim Williams said, well, hell, we liked it. Yeah. And, and it ended up that George Strait, uh, they were looking for a song for George that had a little innuendo. And, and George could pull it off. Oh, yeah. always five major labels. There were offshoots of them, you know, other side labels and things. Branches. But, but now there's three. I mean, I mean, there was just recently four, and now there's three. That it's, they're, they're dinosaurs. I, I got a friend, uh, the guy uh, that invented the Lynn drum, Roger Lynn. He spoke before a group of uh, record executives in 1989. And he said, you, you better make your songs available digitally before the kids figure it out. That was 1989. Wow. Fast forward to 1999, you know what they've done so far? Nothing. It was too late. Yeah. It's really too late. Started. If somehow the labels made all their albums, all their product available digitally,